and we are live. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're, do you're doing well. Uh, welcome to the stream. I hope you had a, a nice week. Uh, and I'm very happy to have you back here for a new interview with a member of the European Parliament, an interview right before the weekend, just like we like it. Uh, so tonight, uh, we will we'll discuss with uh, Dutch MEP Toy Schreuten uh, from the Socialist and Democrats group. So on the left side uh, of EU politics, he is uh, 48 years old uh, and he has been a uh, Dutch MEP since uh, April 2021. So he's not even one year old in the parliament, uh, he is brand new. Uh, and in the parliament, he's working uh, as a member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs and as a substitute in the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. Uh, and within these committees, because those are quite wide topics, uh, he, mo he mostly works on, on the rule of law, migration, uh, the Western Balkan, the Eastern Partnership country, China, Belarus, so lots of, lots of good things there. Uh, hello Andrews, hello Carpas. Uh, as usual, before we start our conversation, I remind the house rules for anyone here tonight who would be uh, new with us. So uh, our guest will stay with us for about an hour. hour. After that, he, he will go and uh, enjoy the, the rest of his evening and maybe his weekend. Uh, Why do we be stuck with me for another half an hour uh, to... Debrief a bit what you thought about the interview, uh, provide additional context, uh, that sort of thing, uh, to, to complete a bit what, what we discuss. As usual, I have prepared my own questions uh, for Mr. Reuton, uh, and I collected questions from people on Reddit and Discord. Uh, if you're watching this on Twitch or YouTube, you can also ask your question via the chat. Uh, I will keep an eye on it uh, along, along the stream and pick among your suggestions. So, and if you're watching from Twitter, well, come over on Twitch or YouTube uh, and ask your questions. But in any case, uh, feel free to participate and react. But as always, don't spam and stay civil. Uh, the goal of these interviews is for you to, to better understand what is the job of an MEP, uh, who is Mr. Reuton in, in this case, what are his priorities, uh, maybe we'll know more about what he thinks about uh, the EU, general political questions, uh, the current news, that sort of thing. Uh, we will not go too deep into policy discussions and we will not touch on national politics unless it's very relevant to EU politics. So keep that in mind when asking your questions. Uh, and on this note, well, I suggest that we start. So good evening, Mr. Reuton. Welcome on the, on the channel and thank you for, for, for taking the time. Um, so you heard me doing, uh, doing the introduction. Uh, I don't know if I forgot anything uh, regarding the basics. Uh, so if I did, uh, feel free now to, to complete. No? <laughs> okay. Oh, it's great. Oh, it's great. Perfect. I'm, I'm doing my job well. I'm very happy about it. Um, so perhaps to kickstart a bit our, our discussion, could, could you tell us a bit about uh, your, your experience? How and why did you go into politics in the first place and then later down the track became an MEP? What's your story? Well, I think I think like many people who go into politics, um, they want to change something. They want to uh, improve things. Uh, maybe it starts uh, usually for many people, it starts uh, in their own neighborhoods because they worry about something and they uh, start uh, going into politics. I myself uh, was uh, interested in politics uh, and also in international affairs, I must say, from a quite an early age. Um, um, but I did never pursued it as a career. So I did a lot of political things, but also in between my political responsibilities in local politics or as a poli policy advisor, I also uh, worked in other fields for an NGO or uh, for a cultural project. Um, so I always tried to stay a little bit fresh. And um, well, now entering in the European Parliament in April 2021 was a surprise a little bit because my predecessor left to the national parliament. She went to the Dutch parliament. Um, so that uh, uh, was well, a surprise, a pleasant surprise. And I'm very honored that I can uh, do this uh, this work now in the European parliament. Uh, and, and so you just said that uh, joining the parliament was a, came a bit as a surprise. You didn't expect that you or your colleague that you're repra uh, re replacing uh, left to, for national politics. So how did you deal with uh, suddenly someone calling you, oh, by the way, I'm leaving, uh, the, I'm leaving the European Parliament, so you're going to be next in line. So how do you deal with uh, this, this change in life? Because I imagine that you, uh, you had other plans uh, for, 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 for these few years. Yeah, well, in the Netherlands, uh, we elect the members of the European Parliament in a uh, list system. So I was the first runner up. So I knew that I uh, could get a call at some point, but I always also said, uh, I mean, you can also remain first runner-up for five years uh, um, and never enter in the parliament. But 
In this case, I was informed, I think, about three and a half months before um, that I entered the parliament that, that she was going to be on a very high position in the national list and uh, very likely to be elected. So I could prepare. And of course, my uh, previous employer, uh, GRI, Global Reporting Initiative, working on sustainability, uh, was not super happy. But on the other hand, also, um, well, they saw the beauty of it also because leave and, uh, and one of your employees leaving for the European Parliament is always uh, also a little bit of a compliment, of course. And uh, st still on, on, on this topic, how, how much preparation does it require to, to, to become an MEP when you're joining midterm? Because we're uh, 2021, we were almost at the midterm. Uh, mm. Like you were informed three months and a half before the, the yeah. Dutch elections. Uh, so how, how long is the process? Well, it's a very good question, actually, because... Uh, in general, and I think that goes also for people who start just at the beginning of a term, uh, you, you typically would like to have the time to, to read into the topics and to, to deepen your knowledge about things and about how the parliament works. But literally, there's no time for that. Uh, you need to be ready. You need to go right away. Uh, the process and also the dynamics of the European parliament that are quite, quite special. They ask that also from you because you need to to get um, a name and a position also to achieve things. Uh, so there's really no time for a, for a, a trial period. Uh, luckily, I had um, um, been interested in international politics uh, for uh, my, the greater part of my life. I studied international relations, also worked in local politics, but I don't think that's a contradiction. And I keep kept following international politics. And I was very lucky that I could take over the committees of my predecessor that are very close to my interest and my uh, fields of knowledge. Uh, so, um, so that was a, that was a advantage, uh, uh, really. And um, so, I didn't really have big problems there. So, uh, less than a year. No, it's been less than a year that you became uh, you became an MEP. Now you're you fully comfortable in the job. Or you're pretty much a, a fish in the water now. Well, I I must say that I still learn every uh, every week. And that is uh, also about the dynamics in the parliament, how people approach things. I'm, well, maybe a bit of an um, uh, unusual uh, um, MEP because I just start speaking to colleagues about initiatives and then sometimes uh, uh, they take over that initiative. <laughs> so uh, you learn uh, that uh, sometimes um, you need also to make yourself heard several times on the same topic before actually getting heard. Yeah, um, so um, that is something that you have to get used to a little bit. But um, I would advise anyone to uh, that goes into politics uh, in general, but also in the European Parliament, to remain as authentic as possible and to remain also as as uh, well, genuine uh, and close to yourself. Um, I'm trying, and uh, for now that seems to work because uh, because I always liked and loved to work be, uh, based on trust so um, uh, so that is uh, i think always a good uh, a good starting point and so now you're in parliament uh, i mentioned a bit the, the, the topics that you you work on the, during my introduction uh, how did you come to choose these uh, this to I mean, actually did you choose these topics or were there, was it like the coordinator or someone told you oh there's this topic to deal with you're going to deal with it how, how did it work well in my experience you have uh, a lot of freedom as a uh, member of the European uh, Parliament. Um, the top, the, the committees that that you follow uh, are very broad. Uh, for example, the Foreign Policy Committee, Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, deals with with well, the whole world, the whole world outside uh, the European uh, Union. Um, and uh, the same goes for the Libra Committee. The Libra Committee is actually the the the, the, the committee uh, where most, the biggest chunk of re legislation passes through, about twenty five percent. So a lot of work in that committee as well. So there's a lot of uh, options to choose. And your priorities, the priorities you want to embark on, well, you have to look a little bit uh, also, uh, well, your own interests are important, but also look at the um, who, who is already active in your group uh, on, on, on certain topics, um, what, where, where are possibilities to link topics with each other, eh? uh, also from the Libre Committee and the uh, uh, foreign affairs committee um, and um, well but you have a big degree of freedom and i um, uh, stick with uh, with topics that are close to my heart close to the uh, also i think 
the interest of uh, of countries like the Netherlands, not only the Netherlands, but countries like the Netherlands who are very open, who have a very international uh, profile. Uh, so yes, you 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 choose a little bit along along these lines, but in in in, in lines in general, a lot of freedom there. Okay, uh, so let's start a bit by, by talking about. Uh... What you're doing in AFET, uh, I understand that you, yeah. you you're working uh, on, on a lot on Belarus. Uh, I understand you you became shadow reporter on the on the topic uh, or yes. reporter. Yes, I I, I was uh, appointed shadow reporter last week on that uh, on behalf of my group. So I will be dealing with Belarus well at least for the rest of the term. I hope, but but that was not to my to me it was not a surprise in 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 the in the sense that I picked up on Belarus like. A month after I started in the parliament, because uh, coincidentally, right after the hijacking of the plane, the mm -hmm. Ryanair plane, um, uh, I already had planned a meeting with a, um, a political activist uh, to speak with him about the situation in Belarus. Uh, and coincidentally, um, uh, that meeting then happened three days after the hijacking of the of the airplane, because I could not foresee that that would happen. And Unfortunately, this guy I spoke to um, back then uh, now is in prison already for nine months, uh, about seven months now. Um, and uh, well, I'm really uh, uh, embarked on uh, on um, uh, well trying to foster trying to foster the opposition outside Belarus, but also uh, close contacts with a lot of people in the diaspora, um, and uh, and of course the uh, the whole well cluster of topics related to what Lukashenko. Uh, was trying to uh, to do with uh, pushing people off the border, putting them in harm's way, uh, creating a humanitarian crisis uh, 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 for these people uh, in the in the forests uh, on the Polish-Belarus border. So I visited also Poland and the border between Lithuania and Belarus uh, in October. Uh, so before we we dive into the yeah. more the, the migration aspect, yeah. because Belarus there was a lot of things that happened, yeah, like, like you mentioned. Uh, so, what is your analysis of Belarus as a country? I mean, in, in its relation uh, with the EU, because it, usually it's a, it, it's kind of, it stands a bit as a as a as an odd uh, odd dog because it's partly a, a Russian satellite, but at the same time it has complicated relation with the EU and and, and Russia. So, Belarus, what's up with it, <laughs> basically? Well, first of all, um, and 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 well, for a while I think we 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 took that a little bit for granted. But this is the longest, uh, one of the longest uh, uh, serving dictatorships and dictators in um, in the world, and surely the the, the last uh, dictator in um, on the European uh, continent, if you if you don't count uh, uh, Mr. Putin, uh, of course. But um, uh, yes, this is a um, a, a particular uh, case because. Uh, um, I think that that also Lukashenko uh, um, evaluated into the dictator he is now simply because he went into that street where he cannot uh, get out anymore and he only has now one option and that is to continue. There are no other options where he's in the beginning also when Lukashenko came to power and especially of course in the years right after uh, the independence from the from the Soviet uh, Union. There was a little hope that uh, Belarus actually uh, would uh, join the family of, of, of democratic states. And even, even in the beginning, the first uh, several years of, uh, of, of Lukashenko's uh, regime or uh, reign, he was um, actually, well, at, at times, uh, seeking um, uh, some contact also with, uh, with the European Union because he also saw at the time that um, that uh, it was probably not the best idea to be only depending on uh, big uh, big brother uh, Russia. Um, however, uh, he now maneuvered himself into a situation that he is he became fully dependent on uh, on the Kremlin, and um, uh, and I think that um, that uh, well, it is a big problem. I think also for uh, for the European uh, Union uh, because he. As a lot of autocrats that remain in power, even populist autocrats that remain in power, he became increasingly unpredictable, and uh, and that is um, uh, of course something we also see with uh, with Putin, uh, him changing over time. Uh, so yes, it's terrible. But I'm my prime primary motivation is also what I see happening on the ground with the people of Belarus, as I always say, uh, also with regard to Turkey or with 
with regard to Russia, um, we do not have a problem with the people of Belarus. On the contrary, mm. uh, we have so a problem government, with, the, yeah. with the regime. Mm. Uh, and uh, and I see that uh, what what you see in Belarus is is of of extreme proportions because the number of political prisoners, the number of closing closed down uh, civil uh, society organizations, human rights uh, activists uh, imprisoned is compared to the size of the population is incredible. And um, it's uh, it's really um, uh, something that has to end as soon as possible. But and I've been very active on the sanctions. Uh, a lot of people are cynical about the effect of sanctions, but that's partly also due to the fact that we uh, do not uh, impose the sanctions in the right way or and start to negotiate all kind of exceptions or all kind of loopholes. Uh, so I'm still very, very committed to try and see if we can even put more pressure on uh, on the regime because this has to end as soon as possible. And so, I mean, you, you, you mentioned the, the, the sanctions and at the same time, the fact that we, we need to send the message that uh, uh, the EU and uh, does not stand against the Belarus population, but against the regime. So, where how do you define the fine line uh, on how the EU should treat uh, Belarus? Like at the same time, it's it's an uh, autocratic regime, so you want to keep it at bay and uh, and sanction it for for what it does, but you don't want to to sink the country because you would uh, you would arm the regular citizen. You would also push it further yeah. into the into the Russian influence. So, where where do you put the the line between? Uh, uh, in the new yeah. relationship uh, with Belarus. No, that, that's a good point. That's in general a good point when it comes to, to trying to, uh, to, to um, uh, deal with, with regimes uh, by sanctions, etc. Um, I think we also have to go by what the opposition, what the people still in Belarus, but also the, the opposition uh, um, led by uh, Tsikhanouskaya, what they tell us. And I've heard also personally from people within Belarus that they say, well, yes, it should not take too long, but please, please, please bring on the pressure on the regime. We can handle it. We have been in this situation of, of well, uh, um, a very dire situation for a while. So we can support this for uh, a little while longer. And what is important, I think, in the case of Belarus and what, what makes it a bit different from other countries is that... Um, because of the uh, incredible span of control of Lukashenko, also the the businesses that you would target with your sanctions largely are the the, the money of of that is largely going in directly into the hands of the regime. So, uh, well, funny enough, uh, uh, targeting very good and very uh, complete on, for example, the main sector, uh, the potash sector in uh, in in Belarus could uh, be more effective. But I'm also thinking of uh, being uh, smarter and being more intelligent when it comes to isolating the regime. Also, uh, yeah, in terms of their way of movement and also the way the, the movement, uh, the possibilities for moving for their relatives and friends uh, eh, that still on different types of visa uh, are mm -hmm. moving around in, in Europe. We have not exhausted yet all the possibilities and I repeat, I think it's also up to the member states to look into their own responsibility because even my country, but also other countries, uh, have uh, not exhausted all the ways to close loopholes uh, that make uh, money run to the regime. And we've seen what the availability of some funds, some money can do eh, when he started to, uh, to uh, get planes and uh, um, uh, send planes to... Uh, to, uh, to countries to get uh, people um, uh, mm. in need uh, to, to Belarus. Yeah. So uh, here you're referring to the, 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 the fact that to put pressure on the EU, uh, Lukashenko, well, I think we can say he basically weaponized uh, immigrants and then threw their, uh, sh shipping them from Iraq, from Syria, from, a, uh, from, from countries in the Middle East, and, but not, not only, and then basically throw, throw them at the, the Polish and Lithuanian border, and if I if I recall, uh, you were part of a mission uh, at the Polish border with Belarus back in October or November. So, uh, can you tell us a bit what you saw there? What was the situation on the ground? Well, yeah, uh, with with pleasure. I went uh, with my colleague, a colleague from the Greens. It was actually a a very ad hoc uh, personal mission uh, by us to Poland and Lithuania, and we spoke in Poland 
um, funny enough, also with the uh, people from Frontex. Frontex, the border protection uh, agency of the European Union, has its headquarters, ironically, in Warsaw, but the Polish government doesn't want to have anything to do with European agencies such as Frontex, but more importantly, also the European Asylum uh, Agency. Um, uh, to add on that, uh, the Polish also uh, refused uh, categorically to to let us go to the border, like everyone else, even the European Commission, even UNHCR cannot access the border, uh, let alone journalists and, um, and humanitarian organizations. In Lithuania, however, we saw a bit of a different picture. We, we were allowed to go and see the border. Um, and we also spoke to some refugees there in, um, in a uh, facility um, uh, that were um, uh, at the well, Lithuanian side of the, of the border. And there is a difference between the two countries. Uh, Lithuania and Poland both have legalized in national law uh, pushbacks. So they said, we uh, uh, think that we are allowed now in, in this emergency situation uh, to, uh, to not uh, um, uh, accept all requests for asylum, but push migrants back, uh, back into Belarus over the border. I have a problem with that because that is against uh, European legislation. Um, uh, and um, I also have a problem with that because when others like Lukashenko are trying to um, use people, use uh, vulnerable people um, uh, to uh, destabilize us, uh, clearly ignoring all fundamental rights and fundamental values of these people, I think that we from the European Union should not lower ourselves to the same level, but we should remain on our level, respecting our own values, our own rules regarding uh, asylum and, um, and migration. Having said that, I'm all open to discuss if, for example, in Lithuania, which was the case that they had to, there were 4,000 people coming in August where normally there would come 20 or 80 people a year. That is, of course, a lot for a country like Lithuania. But, uh, but Poland uh, is a different case. Poland um, uh, used also this crisis at the border, and they, they love to call it a crisis or even an act of war, which I also oppose because uh, it's not that um, uh, that much of an, uh, a crisis uh, if you compare it to what happened in, um, in 2015, for mm -hmm. example, or what's happening even today in Lampedusa eh? um, in numbers. But Poland instrumentalized also this issue at the, at the border to also, well, uh, uh, redirect attention from their problems that they have with the rule of law in their own country. I think Polish people are gradually seeing that also, and they use this also to create an atmosphere of, um, well, it's um, it's now time to defend our country, to defend the borders. And this is a problem because the European Union and the other member states, uh, they have also turned a little bit their head away of this case, because what you should do when there is a problem in one of our uh, common uh, borders is that we should help each other and we should uh, um, uh, also help with taking in and taking over uh, people who are uh, at the border and uh, cannot be uh, granted a, a regular asylum procedure if they ask for that. Um, and still, still on, uh, on Belarus, uh, but also a bit with Ukraine because now those are very yeah. topic, to, uh, topical uh, in the news. Uh, it, what happened in Belarus and Ukraine raised the question a bit uh, of the, the, the notion of a sphere of influence, uh, notably yeah. with Russia. Uh, and Russia being quite keen on maintaining firmly some countries uh, under its influence. So do, do you think that the EU should, to an extent, uh, abandon its claim on, on, country, on, on further relationship with countries like Ukraine to, to, and leave them to Russia? Or should uh, the EU, on the contrary, say, no, that's up to uh, Ukraine. Ukraine wants to have a relationship with us, deal with it, but we're, we're going to stay there. Well, I, I think, first of all, we, we do not have a claim on any country, uh, also not on, uh, on, on a country uh, uh, and trying to, like, sort of tempt a country into mm -hmm. something that they would not want. Uh, the, the basic and fundamental point is that Ukrainians should decide about what where, the direction uh, which Ukraine is going. And uh, I admire uh, uh, what has happened uh, in the past uh, decade, decade or two, in terms of improvement of democracy. And I think that Ukrainians also feel that they now, contrary maybe to uh, 2008 or 2014, they have something to lose 
And they have uh, um, uh, well uh, conquered um, uh, rights, conquered uh, some um, uh, some uh, democracy, some rule of law uh, that is more like uh, what we uh, uh, what we want. Although there are still a lot of steps to go uh, for Ukraine to become at the same level uh, of of the European Union, but they have something to lose now. And, uh, and I think that, uh, that it's ultimately that right that we defend, the right for Ukraine to decide about its own fate, the uh, alliances that it wants to uh, be part of, uh, the ambitions that it has. Um, so yes, it, I think that that is the fundamental uh, point. And another thing in this whole, a little bit constructed reality, constructed by uh, Mr. Putin, is that there is actually no threat to Russia at this moment. Uh, from from any of the European countries. He is talking and trying to uh, indoctrinate um, uh, his own population with a falsified story that there is some kind of um, uh, closing in of Russia. No, uh, if, if there's a, a, a situation of closing in, it's Ukraine that's closed in now by uh, Russian troops uh, almost on all sides uh, of the country. Uh, including the western side, because Russia also still has uh, troops in um, in the eastern part of Moldova. Uh, so um, it is really a, a constructed reality, which is also influenced, and that is, I think, well, uh, I, I don't know to which extent we should do that, but it's also related to a, some kind of nostalgic um, nostalgia uh, by Putin, not to restore the entire Soviet Union, but to restore some greatness of the greater Russia, as, uh, as, as it's called uh, um, uh, frequently. And um, that is problematic because uh, um, many of these countries that he considers part of uh, greater Russia are by now independent countries with mm -hmm. some kind of tradition, even a democratic uh, tradition. And uh, um, yes, I, I, I think and that goes for Belarus as well, but also for many other countries. It's not up to us, up to the European Union, to impose democracy or to impose something on other countries. That would also be impossible in my uh, view. But what we do have to do is to try to spread at least the, the story, the values of the European Union and um, try to preserve democracy where there is democracy, uh, because that is not uh, something we can take for granted. Um, so since we're talking about Ukraine, it brings one uh, one topic uh, to an extent is the the, the limitations to the, the the power that the EU actually has uh, in terms yeah. of for, foreign policy uh, for uh, foreign relations. And uh, I had a question in the chat of some someone asking, should there be like a treaty change? Uh, if there was a treaty change, what would you do? What would you change uh, when it comes to EU foreign relations? What do you think the EU is lacking at the moment? Well, I, I, I'm uh, um, coincidentally shadow rapporteur for the for this year's common foreign security policy report. That is uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, jargon there, but it basically um, uh, is looking at what is the level at this moment of our common foreign security policy, and um, uh, and and how is it going, and what should be improved. And the European Parliament uh, in, in normally is much more ambitious than both the. European Commission and the member states, because we are in the European Parliament, and that is broader than just my group or the Greens or Progressives. That's also Renew. That's also uh, the EPP. Uh, we really uh, believe that we only in this rapidly changing geopolitical situation in this world, we only stand a chance if we operate as a bloc, uh, united, and and we also take into account their. Uh, the, the arguably the most important power that the European Union have, has, and that is its trade power, its regulatory and trade uh, uh, power. We have to link that, combine that with our foreign policy uh, positions. But in general, the foreign policy positions should be more united and we should be more effective in terms of adopting these positions because nowadays it sometimes takes a month longer than, for example, the UK, the US or Canada uh, before the EU, the EU finally comes to um, an agreed uh, position. The exception was probably after the hijacking of the airplane uh, above Belarus. But um, but in general, we need to really, really improve that. And in that respect, I'm also happy with, uh, well, the, at least the attempt for the strategic compass had to really 
start looking at this geopolitical uh, role, but it's about time because we have lost too many years um, of, of inactivity there. And also maybe we're a little bit uh, lazy uh, because there was not a real threat. There was not a real um, situation that urged us to be united. And, um, and I think in that respect, also a situation like we're experiencing now with Ukraine, uh, ironically also helps a little bit to to uh, unite positions. Uh, mm. uh, well, we still have Mr. Orban going to Moscow, but... Yeah, that, that uh, was actually the, the, the point I, <laughs> I was going to make. We're talking about uh, reaching common EU position, but uh, like on Ukraine, we yeah. see a wide majority, I would say, of country who are happy to, 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 to support Ukraine. And then we see Viktor Orban flying to, uh, to, 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 to Moscow to, to meet Putin and uh, yeah. uh, muddling a bit the water there. So... Yeah. That, that, uh, how do you deal with that? Well, yeah, of course, I'm not happy with that. And um, on the other hand, um, I'm also not saying that uh, no one should fly to Moscow again, that it all should be uh, um, uh, one, uh, one man or one woman, woman show only. Uh, but we need to operate along the same lines, with the same strategy, with the same perspective uh, in front of us. And that is problematic. But on the other hand, I'm also pragmatic and and positive and hopeful uh, at times, because I also do think that by now, and uh, well, Orban also in terms of foreign policy with his behavior on some sanction decisions that have been taken, he disqualified himself uh, quite a bit. And we adopted a sort of practice now that it is also possible uh, to adopt certain positions uh, um, uh, stating, and, and I think Mr. Borrell has been at times quite creative on that. Uh, 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 just saying that uh, 26 countries decided to do so huh? and then move ahead also a little bit not ignoring well yeah because it's 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 uh, if we let us be hijacked all the time by one uh, autocrat who actually is interested in only one thing and that is to stay in power uh, after the 3rd of April then uh, it becomes really problematic but it is a problem and that is also why in my other responsibility in the rule of law committee, I'm very much involved in um, well in defending the rule of law and actually trying to um, uh, create a situation where we can but be much more tougher with populistic autocrats like um, Orban. And and still on a, on a, maybe a yeah. final question on on, on uh, foreign policy. Yeah, there's usually a, the, the, a bit the, the, the parody of the EU position uh, whenever the EU is talking about an issue that is just saying, oh, the EU is very concerned about something, and that's it. Yeah. So do you, do, do you think there's a problem of the EU like not concretely doing things in foreign policy and just doing like a, a nice communique saying that they're very concerned about the situation and then they're, uh, it's as if they're, uh, they're, 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 it's not worth the paper it's written on, so... To, yeah. Is there a way to make the EU foreign policy more more concrete, more, more I mean, more geopolitical? Uh, the, what you could expect from a from a geopolitical power? Well, for sure, uh, that hampers at times also our credibility, and I think it also resonates with a lot of viewers uh, uh, that that the EU uh, and and we are also part of that. The European Parliament also adopts positions and adopts resolutions and uh, calling on doing this or doing that. Uh, and that is why I also made the link with our trade power and with our regulatory power. Uh, arguably, one of the uh, most um, powerful instruments that we have is the trade. And I think that it's very important to link foreign policy instrument, the human rights sanction regime, to this trade power. And that is also not without, uh, without uh, problems. I realize that. And I think that people uh, watching, and I'm also interested to learn how, how they think about that, but... It is not for free, in my opinion, to have an opinion about human rights. And that is, for example, very, uh, very clear, I think, with the situation in China. Of course, it is not realistic that we um, uh, ban all trade with China unless they start to respect human rights. But it's not for free to be concerned about the situation with the Uyghurs or about the situation with Hong Kong. That means that we have at some point to realize that that also might be a little painful for ourselves that we have to accept the consequence that at some point when we will ban certain products that some products will be less available in 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 europe or that we have to find uh, alternatives uh, for these uh, products and the same is uh, goes with with some other uh, 
um, problematic um, uh, uh, regimes that we are dealing uh, with. It's not for free to uh, to uh, have principles, uh, I, I sometimes uh, uh, say. And we have to take that into account and we have to be more firm in linking concrete actions, concrete uh, incentives, especially on trade, uh, also to our foreign policy positions. But then you have the, you have the issue of uh, dealing with the national interest. I mean, the, the, the current example that, come to my, that comes to mind is the uh, let's say, very ambiguous position of the German government, or at least one part yes. of the German government, uh, towards Russia and also to a lesser extent to, to, towards China because there are big economic relationships between uh, Germany, Russia and, Ch and China. And so the government yeah. is not too keen to have uh, to take sanction and to take a very hard EU position towards this country. And uh, since we're working on the basis of, uh, of unanimity yes. on, on a lot of these matters, Again, uh, does it not like neutralize the entire exercise to have like a national interest just go uh, go neutralize the entire EU position? Well, one of the one of the issues that I uh, uh, came across myself in my first month in the European Parliament was the position of also my group, eh? and I think it's interesting maybe for the for the viewers to 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 to, to speak about that because yes, even within political groups like the Socialists and Democrats, there are sometimes different positions and. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the Nord Stream issue uh, is one of the interesting positions where my uh, comrades, uh, if I may say so, from the SPD in Germany have a different position than the majority of our group, of the S&D uh, group. Uh, and I always uh, voted in favor of uh, positions that were saying, look, we need to be careful with starting using Nord Stream, uh, preferably not even finishing it because it gives uh, Russia a little too much power, too much um, uh, weight over our um, uh, energy uh, uh, supplies. Um, but, you know, it is a difficult topic and, and, and it's, it's, it's also important here to always uh, keep in mind that in Europe, it is about striking the right balance. And I think that Germany eventually, eventually will understand that it's ultimately also in their interest, even if they are the largest economy by far in the in the European area in the EU um, uh, in the EU, European Union, it is also in their interest to operate as a bloc. Yeah? So ultimately, I think that we will have to strike a balance uh, on that. Uh, but um, yes, I can cannot only but agree uh, with you that um, uh, at times it is uh, it is problematic. Uh, but I'm hopeful. I think that that we can step by step uh, uh, progress also on this and. Uh, um, the, this is this is also what politics is about. Keep mm -hmm. on talking and keep on trying to convince also people who are close to you uh, in uh, almost all um, uh, all uh, political um, uh, issues. Uh, but sometimes you have different opinions even within your own group. And um, actually, uh, the, that specific one, there was a question from the chat that I was keeping aside for the end because it's it was not on, on foreign policy. But now that we are diving into it, uh, I'm going to ask that is... How so? The, the the person in the chat was saying that he is from the German SPD, and so he was wondering right. how uh, how different are the uh, are the different socialist party within the yeah. the socialist group. How do you deal with the different initiatives, different ideas, yeah. or general plans? So, can you tell us a oh, bit about the diversity within uh, yeah. SND? Yeah, I love to. It's a great question. I think I think uh, well from all groups, eh, but who am I to judge about the all, all, all the other groups? But I think from all groups. Uh, I think we are doing pretty well in terms of being uh, uh, playing uh, as a team and uh, uh, having a, a good uh, common position on most uh, topics. But it's inevitable that uh, in a in a large group uh, like also the Socialists and Democrats are, and goes also for the EPP and Renew, uh, that you have very different um, uh, different uh, parties coming from these uh, these uh, national delegations. And um, yes. You cannot just say it's a difference between northern and southern countries uh, in general. No, because sometimes you also have uh, positions that are uh, really identical between some of the northern countries and some of the southern countries. And as I said on Nord Stream, for example, my delegation, the Dutch Labour Party, had a different opinion than the SPD, but on a lot of other topics, especially linked to economy, to welfare, to social uh, conditions, to working conditions, of course, my delegation, Dutch delegation, thinks much more uh, uh, alike 
like the like the Germans and also the Scandinavian uh, countries. Eh? So so it is not uh, uh, you cannot put a, a model uh, over that uh, a layover and say look this is how these groups uh, are are operating and that is also part of the uh, interesting dynamic of the European Parliament and something I really enjoy because I speak a lot with colleagues I also speak Italian because I'm half Italian my mother is from Italy and uh, that's interesting to to talk to people from all these countries from Spain from Italy from France from Germany and to to have a different perspective on the same topic, even within your own uh, own group, that is part also of the spirit of Europe, mm -hmm. trying to um, eh, to get further, to get step by step further. You never go as fast as you would want to go, but step by step, we uh, we um, uh, come uh, come together uh, and eh, unity in diversity, as it's uh, as it's called. Um, uh, yes, it's it sounds maybe very plain and very uh, like a uh, a slogan, but it is true. And um, and uh, well, I, thanks for that question because because I think that sometimes um, the political groups maybe are seen as like um, factories of positions, but we really discuss these uh, things also among us, and I think that's important. Okay, um, let's let's this time talk a bit about the Balkan, uh, the Western yeah. Balkans, uh, yeah. and we're not going to talk so much about the foreign policy aspect, but about the the uh, the enlargement aspect, uh, because the, 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 the Balkans yeah. are among the top prospects for as countries will might join eventually the, the, the EU. Yeah. But we see that there are still a lot of, uh, of issues where within these countries before they are able to, 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 to join the, uh, the EU. And uh, among the questions I received, someone was, was pointing out to the, to the, the issue of uh, uh, organized crime in the Western Balkan. Uh, and I imagine the person was Dutch because he was bringing a Dutch example about a seizure of, of drugs in, in Rotterdam uh, linked to the Albanian uh, criminality. And so the, the person was asking, do you see the, 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 the presence of these criminal networks in the Balkan as a, as a threat to the, uh, to the, the, the perspective uh, of this country to join the EU? Or is it like every country has criminals and uh, we are going to deal with it uh, like we're dealing with uh, uh, French criminality, German criminality, Dutch criminality, etc., etc., etc.? Unfortunately, <laughs> there are criminals everywhere uh, still. But, um, but to be serious on this, a very good question, I think, because uh, what, two months ago, in the European Parliament, we discussed actually a report on a uh, situation of organized crime and the networks and the links with the Western Balkans. And uh, yes, the problem with uh, uh, some of the uh, ports, the big ports in um, in uh, Western Europe, in Rotterdam, Antwerp, um, yes, there are uh, they are used for uh, drug trafficking, but there's also another development which is linked to that because what you also see is that where the port of Rotterdam was typically also a port uh, for that kind of transport. Now, for example, the drugs traffickers from South America are, are because of intensified controls in the European Union, are um, moving and 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 moving their transports towards, for example, ports like Bar in Montenegro. Uh, uh, so um, it's not a solution to uh, uh, to uh, just take care of the business in your own uh, country, which we also should do, and we should still remain very uh, strong against um, criminal networks originating uh, in the Western Balkans, but also in other countries, of course. But we that is precisely the reason that we, whatever the outcome of any um, uh, alignment or even integration or enlargement process is, we cannot um, afford to uh, leave this region, which is not well, it is still outside the European Union, but is effectively surrounded by European Union, the Western Balkans. So it is actually in the heart of Europe already, just not in the European Union. It is in our own interest, in our own interest, um, even if you like uh, enlargement or you don't, but it's in our own interest to be engaged with the Western Balkans and to help these countries to fight organized crime, because otherwise it ultimately will become, the Western Balkans will become... Um, a playground for uh, these kind of organizations uh, where they get more and more trouble, uh, fortunately, in the European Union to have a space of maneuver. Um, so it is a linked uh, a linked problem. And, um, and uh, yes, we need to continue to do uh, our job back home uh, in the European Union. 
but we cannot look away from the Western Balkans despite the difficulties, and maybe we come to that uh, with, with some of the countries. Um, so that's why I'm really invested in the region, despite uh, the difficulty also of, uh, of the topic. And uh, another uh, sticky issue with, uh, with the Balkans, uh, Western Balkans, is in, uh, an obstacle, so to say, to, to the entry in the EU, is the heritage of the, of the, the Balkanic wars in the, in the 90s. Uh, yeah. And do, do you think that the, the perspective on this country to, to join the EU is uh, appealing enough for, to push these countries to, to, uh, to put the past behind them and, and, and work together? Or do you think that it's still very much an internal process and the EU is, I mean, the, it's not the EU that is going to solve the, uh, that's going to solve the heritage of the Balkanic wars uh, uh, on its own, just by... Uh, yeah, using well, the I, I, yeah, I would hope I would hope that the perspective of becoming part of the European Union still has some kind of uh, of uh, transformative power. But I also have to be honest: uh, the transformative power of European Union membership that we have seen in the past, uh, eh, probably the last country that demonstrated this transformative power as a sort of driver for internal change and, 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 and changed a lot of things in, in record time was probably Croatia. Um, but um, we also have to acknowledge that uh, the reforms, the, the, the reforms that are necessary in, 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 in many of these countries have not gone as, as, as fast as we hoped. And also not as fast as is good for the people in the Western Balkans, because for me, uh, despite my positive attitude towards a possible membership for these countries, But the ultimate prize for these countries is not the EU membership. The ultimate prize for these countries is to have a better country, to have a country with a rule of law, with a, a rules-based uh, economy. And, um, well, there is also some good news because, uh, well, Albania and North Macedonia are not yet uh, ready to become member tomorrow, but are at least as far uh, uh, as, as is uh, necessary Uh, to start the, the negotiations, the real, uh, the real negotiations. Um, that is, however, still uh, blocked by Bulgaria, but I hope that that will be solved uh, uh, in the, this half year. Um, but um, uh, yes, for other countries, um, the situation is not, uh, not looking very pretty. And that is also part, partly to blame on the European Union itself, because our credibility as a union has been, uh, has been um, uh, well, undermined uh, because uh, the people in the Western Balkan countries also read the newspapers and they have seen how we have dealt with Poland and they see how we deal with uh, people like Orban within our own union and that did not exactly make a very convincing impression there. Uh, on top of that, the same Orban, together with Vucic and together with uh, Dodik in the eastern part of Bosnia, is trying to actively destabilize uh, the region, not uh, because they are seeking war, I hope not, because that would be the, the worst uh, scenario, and I'm, I don't think that that will happen, but the destabilization of the region uh, is caused by uh, giving mixed signals about the importance of the rule of law. That leads to Serbia not uh, even backsliding in terms of the rule of law uh, uh, reforms, and that is bad news, I think, for especially the people living in the Western Balkans. So uh, it's a mixed uh, picture to, uh, to be uh, uh, fair. And then I'm uh, maybe a little bit too optimistic, uh, but, uh, but that doesn't take away that I still uh, stick with my point that we cannot afford to leave this region alone. I travel there quite often. I've been to a few of the countries also uh, in my mandate as an MEP. And um, uh, that even made me more committed to, uh, to work uh, for this, but we should not be naive. And, and Uh, let's say final question on this idea of, uh, of enlargement to the, to the Western Balkan. You, you said that the, that the EU is not uh, white in this, in this, uh, in this issue. They, 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 there's also some things to blame on the, on the EU. Yeah. And one criti uh, criticism that, that, that uh, came was the idea that the, 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 the Western Balkan uh, would, say, would sing the EU as a bit toying with them, saying, oh, you're going to end up, you're going to enter the EU one day but not now and they see like uh, uh, some member state like uh, like france also the netherlands being very critical to the very idea of enlargement and yeah. they, uh, do, yeah. do you think that also on this front the eu is sending mixed message or uh, or there's also a genuine problem like like the eu is not ready yet itself to absorb 
new member state uh, uh uh, even if, like tomorrow, the, the Balkan state were were fulfilling all the reform yeah. uh, that, that they were uh, that they were supposed to do before entering. Yeah, well, if, if they would be ready tomorrow uh, and totally up to speed with our uh, our rules uh, for the rule of law, for the in, uh, independent uh, judiciary, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that would be fantastic news. But but yes, there is also a problem inside the European Union because even if that would be the case, I think uh, a lot of member states and a lot of uh, debates within countries, uh, also within uh, the population and uh, with the population, are not uh, yet that uh, far. But um, I think that um, a part of the problem uh, of the credibility of the European Union is also linked to the fact that um, uh, we have done uh, towards these countries, but that also ultimately hampers ourselves. I think um, we have made well, sort of like promises or expectations uh, uh, and we have not maintained these promises. And that is a very bad thing to do. I mean, I am personally uh, positive about the perspective of these countries if they are ultimately also willing to uh, become part of the European Union, because it is also thinkable that a country wants to do the reforms, wants to become close to the uh, European uh, uh, way of, uh, of, of life, the European values, but decides not to become a member. That's also possible. As I said, with Ukraine, it's up to countries themselves to decide uh, about their uh, future. But what we have done, at, especially in the past, uh, uh, past five years, um, uh, in the period after the last enlargement, is that we have kept them at arm's length. And um, that is, um, well, not a problem if that is actually also what you are telling them, that you are saying, look, it's probably not going to happen. But we did the opposite. We we gave them the hope. We gave them a sort of roadmap. Uh, but we are sometimes not delivering ourselves. And that is uh, a problematic. So that's why I'm also very keen on uh, starting these negotiations, at least with North Macedonia and Albania in the near uh, future. And I'm also I also have a problem uh, with how we are dealing with this on the Commission level, because uh, Commissioner Vaheli is also, um, well, sharing uh, uh, sometimes uh, mixed uh, mixed uh, messages that create at least confusion, uh, to say the least, um, uh, about the EU uh, position, and that is not helpful. Uh, I'm just reading a comment in chat to see if there's a question. Uh... Okay, that's not a question; it's more of a com comment. So let, let's. Let's finish the, the interview uh, on Libé because uh, I have to say we talked a lot about yeah. AFET. Uh, yeah. my, my bad, I had too many questions on that. Let's talk a, a bit about your work in Libé and the rule of law. Uh, so the, 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 the latest news that came on the rule of law is that the commission, I mean, the, the, the commission around us said that uh, even if the commission was to use the, the brand new uh, uh, rule of law mechanism after it, it's likely going to be uh, uh, validated by the uh, by the court of justice in, in February, uh, probably the court, the commission would not use the, the rule of law mechanism against Hungary before the uh, the, the the Hungarian elections uh, in April. Uh, so officially, they're saying it's because there is a due process. There needs to be back and forth between the commission and the, yeah. and the capital. But another argument is also that the commission does not want, does not want to be seen as interfering with the election uh, in Hungary. So where do you stand on that? Do you think that the commission should wait after the... Uh, there's a good argument in saying that the commission should not interfere with the election or the commission should already uh, fire the gun, so to say? Well, yeah, well, that, that, that is a big problem because I think that if they do not do uh, take action deliberately where is they already can, you are also interfering in the election. Uh, because then uh, uh, it means that um, uh, that you are uh, deliberately not doing something that you actually should do, uh, and in my opinion, already should have started, because the European Parliament urged the Commission now already for uh, almost a year uh, to uh, uh, activate the, this mechanism, this new instrument that we have to to keep countries um, uh, to um, uh, to respect the rule of law. Um, uh, so yes, it's long overdue. And uh, I'm actually, and I think that this will not be the last word that has been said about it uh, by uh, Mr. Reinders, uh, because it's our job as the European Parliament, but also uh, in our national parliaments to convince the member states uh, uh, to not, um, uh, to not um, agree with this uh, position. Um, 
I'm already uh, not so happy that we had to wait uh, until after this judgment of the of the of the European Court of Justice. But okay, uh, that will come, and I'm very confident that the uh, European Court of Justice will decide in favor of this mechanism. Uh, so against uh, the position of Hungary and and uh, and Poland. But um, yes, it, it is a very bad idea to wait any day longer to activate uh, this because all, in not activating, you are also interfering um, in uh, in the election. So um, I hope that uh, this is not the last thing that has been said about it from the side of the commission. Uh, again, here, there's many commissioners involved. Also, uh, Commissioner Jourova has a, has, a, has a say in this. Um, and I think this is also um, business of the commission as a whole, uh, because this is the real, real, real threat um, uh, to our credibility internally, but also externally, because without getting this right, without getting uh, countries um, eh, with, that can, are perfectly entitled to have their own political uh, uh, direction, can perfectly be also led by conservative governments. That is not the problem. The problem is that people everywhere in Europe, every citizen, we fight also for the citizens in Poland and Hungary, but also for our own citizens in the in the other countries. Because if you cannot be uh, uh, take for granted anymore the uh, right to an independent judge in any of the EU countries, um, we are really um, going into the wrong direction. It hampers our credibility also outside the Union. And uh, so the, the Hungarian election is going to be in uh, on in April, 3rd of April, if, yeah. I, if I remember well. Uh, let's do a bit of uh, poetic fiction, as we say in French. Um, Let's say that Orban gets re-elected. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you see the EU dealing with him? Because he will be able to... I mean, it's unlikely that he would change track when it comes to the rule of law. He would, he would still do the same, but he would, have, he would be able to say, I can go even further because I just got elected, so I have a, I have a popular back, a backing, I have a, a democratic legitimacy, so uh, we, I can do whatever, the Commission cannot stop me. So how do you think then the EU should deal with a... With a uh, a bolder, a bolder Orban after the after the elections. Yeah, if he was well, elected, it's a, it's a very intriguing uh, uh, question, uh, but um, unfortunately also um, probably not far of the reality. Although I uh, I think that the coalition, the broad coalition, the uh, actually unusual coalition, stands a chance to uh, to beat him. But uh, yes, I think that this exactly this this hypothetical question. Um, uh, exactly proves why it is such a bad idea to wait any minute or any day uh, uh, for taking action when you think, as a guardian of the treaties, as the Commission also likes to call uh, uh, um, uh, herself uh, um, and that, uh, but they are, they are the guardian of the treaties. Uh, that's why it's such a bad idea that we have waited in many occasions, also with Poland, uh, too long to take action because that allowed Orban also to 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 well to to go away uh, further and further uh, from being actually a um, a democracy. In my opinion, uh, Hungary became uh, a captured state uh, in a way, and I'm saying that because uh, the case of Hungary is also a little bit different again from Poland. Poland is also very bad in terms of the independent judiciary, but. Uh, in Hungary, also a lot of state um, uh, competences and state funds are placed outside the control of the parliament. So even if the opposition wins the next election, uh, your scenario was the different one that you proposed to me, but even if the opposition wins the next election, it could be proved to be difficult for them to actually govern and to actually uh, run the country um, uh, with the new uh, majority uh, elected uh, in the parliament because he also changed a lot of uh, things in the structure of the state. So um, yes, if he if he uh, wins the election, he can, to a large extent, continue based on that captured state scenario. Uh, however, I still think that then we have to be very tough and also explain that very well to the Hungarian people, because um, we need to activate all instruments um, available to uh, actually um, make uh, the government uh, change its mind. Uh, and uh, there's no other way because, uh, as you know, we cannot 
withdraw countries out of the European Union. And actually, that, that was my next question. Last year, uh, the Dutch Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, yeah. actually said during a council meeting uh, to, to, to Orban, well, if you, if you keep going that way, uh, we might have to kick you out of the EU. So do you think yeah. it's that's a, that, that, that could be a scenario or, uh, well, or not? I, I, actually, actually, to be very precise, he did, he did say it. Well, uh, uh, legally, he said it right because he said then you might have to uh, uh, go away, eh? and that is exactly what is the possibility uh, that is open to a country to leave the European Union. We've seen that, unfortunately, with uh, with uh, with Britain. The UK, yeah, uh, yeah. But um, uh, I hope that it will not come this far. I would not also not be in favor. So that I, I understand, and I, I think uh, he was uh, nearly within uh, uh, constitutional lines. Uh, <laughs> What, with what he said, but uh, uh, yes, it also is not a good idea because to have a autocrat at your borders is probably worse, <laughs> ironically, than having um, a, uh, a country inside the union because we always have elections again. Eh? I'm hoping that they will beat Orban at the next elections, but um, I'm uh, well, I'm an optimist and maybe. Uh, against uh, against all odds but um uh, i think that we have to deal with this um in our interest in the interest of the hungarian people and also in the interest of of the of the union as a whole um and um, yes i would uh, and really 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 be uh, unfavorable uh, towards a scenario where you would have uh, um, populistic autocrats like uh, mr orban uh, uh, right at your borders instead of uh, inside your uh, union we have to deal with this. So I'm looking at the time. So uh, I will. I see we reach an hour. So I will ask my two last question before I, I free you and let you enjoy the evening. So uh, first yeah. question: If if you could change anything about about the EU uh, and the way EU politics works, uh, works, what would you change and why? That's a that's a tough one. I well, I would I would probably go for something uh, related to the topic that we that we uh, uh, ignored a bit uh, uh, in, in the migration, because I really think uh, that the countries um, uh, should come together now very soon, because we uh, spent six, seven years not solving this problem after the big uh, refugee um, uh, refugee um, crisis uh, with the Syrian, um, the Syrian civil war. Um, so um, we need a humane European asylum and migration policy that is integral that covers the whole perspective uh, because otherwise we will always be confronted with smaller or larger incidents with smaller or larger groups arriving at our borders where it's at sea or in land borders and increasingly we seem to panic them even if it's a small group a relatively small uh, group and that is not the right answer because we have to remain this uh, beacon of hope where there is rule of law, where there is the possibility always to ask for protection, and how can we solve the problem of people uh, coming uh, in larger numbers to the European Union by giving them perspective also on temporary migration, but also creating more perspective for uh, people in Africa uh, predominantly, because uh, what we have done so far was meant good, it was from a good heart, but it was not enough. It was not credible, and it was not uh, really giving him, them perspective on an equal uh, footing because I think that we need to give all these young people in Africa a real perspective for a job, for a decent life uh, and also uh, organize and uh, create a structure where people can uh, come to the European Union for a few years, work here, earn some money, go back, maybe come back another time, but regulate it and also create a um, real solidarity within real solidarity within that system because we cannot leave issues with migration or asylum to the countries uh, at our borders so that would be my biggest wish real change in the field of migration and asylum in the interest of everyone okay and uh, my final question the traditional one on, on the channel uh, where do you stand on the debates about uh, federal Euro European Union? Are you in favor? Are you against? Are you on the fence? What's your thoughts? Well, that's a great question because I have a little bit of news for you because uh, I actually joined uh, joined the Spinelli Group. Oh well, that answers the question then. <laughs> as the first, as the first um, Dutch politician, uh, probably in the in the history of the Spinelli Group, 
And that is because my country, and we were not allowed to talk about national politics, but the Netherlands has a particular uh, a particular thing with the word federalism, because it's it's seen in the Netherlands also dating back to the referendum, but even before the referendum on the constitutional treaty, as it was yep. called. And in the Netherlands, uh, there is a, a big allergy to the word. Uh, so I'm really much in favor of a more federal uh, Europe, a democratic uh, federal Europe. But what I come to know is that within that Spinelli group, within these people who are in favor of further integration towards a federal, uh, more federalized structure, is that uh, there are very many different political opinions there represented in that uh, in that group. So I also want to use that a little bit to start a debate again in the Netherlands about this topic, because I think that a country like the Netherlands cannot afford itself to stay out of that discussion, especially also with the German government now and eh, making a, a big a point of it uh, yes. also in the new uh, in the new German government uh, uh, um, coalition uh, deal, yeah, coalition deal. Uh, so yes, it's um, it's uh, something that I well, it's not my main uh, work, of course. I will be following and working on the foreign policy and and the Libre, but on the side I will engage hopefully in some debates. I just had one with. A few young people because I start I start with the young people, so representative from political youth organizations in the Netherlands, and I just tested their minds a little bit and said, "What is what is what is the emotion you get from this word? And do you see something? Can you look a bit beyond the word? Eh? Because uh, well, there is a lot of emotion attached to it that I think is unhelpful for a fruitful and and good discussion. And uh, uh, I also learned that." Federalism is not an absolute thing. It's not that it's like either this or that. No, it actually uh, is something that is also something you can progress in and that actually protects probably um, uh, a lot of uh, um, worries that people might have in uh, countries like the Netherlands that have not so much experience with federalism itself in their, in their own country. It actually can organize much better what is dealt with at the federal level and maybe in a more in a more uh, um, common and uh, and uh, and um, supranational uh, uh, way but also organize very clearly as you can see in germany for example what is organized at the um at the uh, level of the of the uh, the bundesland in the case of uh, germany so i really look forward to discuss about this topic with uh, with people not only from the netherlands but uh, everywhere else in europe and uh, well a little little piece of uh, of news there in your uh, interview well that's perfect I, I, an exclusivity it's not like I have, I have one every every day so thank you very much for that um, so we reached the, the the end of the hour what I would do is give you the opportunity to say a final word to, to our audience before uh, before you go and enjoy the rest of your evening so the floor of you is yours to, to, to say you are your final words well thank you so much uh, MEP assistant for having me and thanks for everyone who stayed on for uh, the whole hour or uh, for uh, a, a part of it. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, that you enjoyed it, that I was not too long in my answers. Um, and, uh, and please uh, also take the opportunity to engage with me, also if you're uh, uh, not from the Netherlands, uh, because I think that ultimately we have a collective responsibility uh, as citizens, but also uh, us, the 705 members in the European Parliament to, uh, to be available. Uh, uh, to be um, uh, also uh, open to your questions and to your uh, to your thoughts. So um, you know where to find me, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend as well. Well, thank you, Mr. Oyten, for 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 your time in coming. Chat, make make sure to thank Mr. Oyten for his time. Uh, like he mentioned, uh, if you want to, to comment and discuss with him, you can see his Twitter handle just below the video feed. So don't hesitate to, to go on Twitter. And uh, or he also has an Instagram, Facebook and all that. But uh, you, you can find him there and engage, uh, start a conversation where, with him. Uh, and on this note, uh, well, thank you again, Mr. Royton. Have a good evening. Chat, stay with me. We're going we're gonna to start the, the, the debriefing. Bye, Mr. Royton. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, guys. Uh, so... What did we think? Tell me everything. Tell me everything. Oh, I'm going to take my notes in the meantime. I'm going to take a sip of water and read your uh, reactions uh, in a minute. Or well, in, in a few seconds, just the time for me to, to drink a bit of water. So. Up. 
back to my notes. As usual, I uh, looked at the topics the, uh, that we uh, we discussed. Uh, let me just close Zoom as well. There we go. Okay. So the interview was uh, was quite interesting. We, uh, I think it was my bad. We, we ended up talking most of the time about foreign policy. Uh, <laughs> that was painful to listen to. A bit of an ideologue, isn't he? Oh no, I don't think it was that much of a of an ideologue. I mean. Okay, so you, you can recognize that, yeah, that he is a socialist talking about, about foreign policy, but I don't think he's that there was not that much ideology in what, in what he said. Uh, maybe a bit the end uh, about when we, we discussed about migration, but that was like something we, are, we already heard from, uh, from, uh, from other people. and something that you could, the kind of discussion or discourse that you could expect from, uh, from a socialist, especially when, you, when discussing that for like one minute and not exactly going to, uh, into the details. Uh, out in the right place, wonder if it's feasible. Uh, I don't know for the, being able to take harsh measures. That's indeed kind of, kind of, the, kind of the, the, the limitation of the exercise, whether on, on, the, on foreign policy or on, on the... Um, on the rule of law, indeed, the, the, the EU is not really known for, for taking harsh measures, and that's I mean that's part of the of the of the debates about around the potential change in the treaties about foreign policy, about for uh, rule of law, that sort of thing. But anyway, uh, let's dive back into uh, at the beginning. Uh, what did we talked about? Oh, of course, we we talked about. I uh, talked a bit a bit about Libé. He said a, a statistic a statistic I was not aware of that. Uh, 25% of the EU legislation go through Libé, so Libé is the, is the committee in charge of civil liberties and uh, uh, migration and, and all that. It's a, it's a big committee, an important committee in the European Parliament. Uh, a messy committee, it's uh, definitely not a committee I would like to, to, to uh, work in. Uh, not by, because it's not interesting, the topics are very, very, very interesting, but it's a very... Uh, uh sensitive kind of committee because we're dealing with heavy topics uh civil liberties migration so it can, it can be very very conflictual as a as a, as a committee uh interesting but yeah it's uh it's conflictual uh as a, as, a, as a committee uh we took then of course quite a long time i have to i have to say about belarus my bad i was the one asking the question uh he mentioned the the uh, the hijacking of planes by belarus so uh what happened there so it was uh, uh last year what uh, uh so let me start by the beginning so there was uh, as you probably know a presidential election in Bela in belarus a couple of years ago which uh turned into a disaster because the 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 Lukashenko, so the current ruler of Belarus, claimed to have won. Well, in fact, probably uh, didn't win. It was the, uh, the the election was rigged, and it was the the opposition that actually uh, that uh, who actually won. Uh, but he didn't recognize. So yeah, there there was uh, uh, riots and, uh, and demonstrations in the in the street for quite uh, quite some time against uh, against Lukashenko, and most of the opposition uh, left actually uh, Belarus, uh, because otherwise they, they were ending up in prison as, uh, as political prisoners. Uh, and a good part of the, of the political uh, opposition was discussing through uh, Telegram, uh, no, or Signal, I, I, I always uh, mix up the two, uh, one or the other, through the uh, uh, channel that is called Nexta, uh, that, is that was managed by uh, a Belarus uh, guy who was living in, uh, in Poland, if my memory serves right, and one day he was uh, he, he had traveled to Greece for whatever reason with his girlfriend and on the way back to Poland uh, the plane went above uh, above Belarus and uh, the, the the Belarus uh, <clears throat> Belarus uh, fighter actually uh, uh, intercepted the, the flight and said uh, and forced the, the, the flight to, 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 to land in Belarus uh, and not in, uh, in uh, to its final destination. Uh, under the guise that there was a, a bomb threat on board the, on board the, the, the plane. And in fact, when the, the, the plane uh, landed in Belarus, the, 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 the Belarus Secret Service boarded the plane, took out the, 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 the guy who was uh, doing the, uh, uh, leading the, 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 the next channel, so the, the, the main discussion channel and, uh, uh, of the opposition, and took him out of the plane and put him in prison. Uh, so there was a lot of outcry on that because it, it, it was... Basically, the uh, the, uh, the Belarus government doing air, pir air piracy to to get a hold of uh, of the opposition, and after that there was a, a bunch of uh, of uh, 
of sanctions taken against uh, against Belarus to, uh, for instance, uh, forbidding uh, the, the the national airlines from going to the EU. Uh, the uh, different airlines also uh, from now on like uh, avoided the Belarus airspace because they didn't want it that to happen again. So that was a bit the context, and uh, it lay, like I don't know any. Uh, uh, any other examples of air piracy like that done by government for, to 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 catch an, uh, a political opponent? So that was that was kind of a kind of a big thing. Uh, but yeah, Belarus uh, got a bunch of of sanctions linked to the elections, linked to the hijacking, linked to pretty much everything that is happening in Belarus uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, like he mentioned, that there are debates on whether these sanctions are effective, whether they're they are strong enough or or not. So he was uh, he was uh, clearly an advocate of. Uh, of stronger sanctions, uh, he mentioned the, the, the potash uh, sector. So potash is, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, so it's something that is very big in Belarus, one of the main Belarus uh, Belarusian uh, uh, products, uh, something that is uh, that is used as a fertilizer, a fertilizer, if I if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> and uh, a lot of people are asking to, 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 for strong sanctions to be taken against the sector that is key for the. For the Belarus economy, and he was saying that you know, it was necessary, especially since the opposition is asking for this for the for this sanction to to be taken to put pressure uh, and build pressure on the the Belarus government. Uh, then we uh, we uh, we went into the 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 other problem with Belarus, uh, which is the migration, uh, the use of migrants. So I, I said that uh, there was a weaponization of migrants where. The Belarus government is making people coming to uh, to Belarus and then throw them at the at the EU border to try to create a crisis. Uh, sanctions seem to have literally zero effect, both on Russia and Belarus. No sense sending more. I would not say that the the, the sanctions have no effect uh, on Belarus. Uh, at least economically, it, it had some uh, some impact, and also it was the, the sanction against individual had some effect because i mean a lot of them are oligarchs uh, they are they, they are key, they like to travel in the eu they have assets in the eu so it's always having an effect to, to freeze these uh, these assets but it's always the the the, the difficulty on uh, how far can you go because of course you could i mean the eu could completely wreck the economy of belarus but would it who would it hurt more uh, the government or the population that's uh, that's always kind of the of the debate and the the the, the fine line that you that you need to 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 work on uh, and on the the sanctions on Russia again on economy it can be quite effective because those are economies that are not so diversified I mean in the case of Belarus uh, a lot rides on on the uh, depends on on the on the potash industry and then of course on the on the Russians. Uh, and as for sanctions against Russia, it's a very much a, uh, an economy that is uh, turned either towards itself, but also on uh, on the export of gas. So if you eat on that, it has a big effect on 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 on, on the Russia, economically speaking. And uh, to to an extent, these governments uh, stay in place because they, because of oligarchs. Uh, if you cut the, 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 the means for the oligarchs to, to, to get money, uh, then they can end up turning on their, on their masters. So on Lukashenko, on, 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 uh, on Putin, etc., etc. But, uh, uh, even if they are not as effective as, as that, I mean, you can't not take sanction at some point. There, there is a question of, uh, of, of credibility because otherwise if you don't take any sanctions then well what would ever stop them from doing anything so there, there is a there is also this aspect that's as a matter of principle sometimes you have to take sanctions that's uh that's how it works uh so yeah going back to to, to poland the, the thing that uh Paul, like he mentioned a bit, a bit as well is the idea that uh, when the crisis at the border with belarus occurred Poland actually used the crisis, so it was double crisis. The 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 the, the Benaus using that to put pressure on the EU because they knew that there there is a lot of anxiety in some kind of in some number of member states around migration. So by trying to create a, a new refugee crisis at the border with Poland, they were trying to create to destabilize uh, the, the the EU from within. Uh, try to recreate what happened in 2015, most likely to try to to get. 
uh, leverage and, uh, and obtain either the the, uh, the lifting of the sanctions or something in exchange. Uh, but the Polish government also used the, 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 the crisis to its own advantage to do national politics because uh, the, 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 the government was quite pretty criticized at, at, at that moment. There was a lot, a lot of protests early linked to abortion and, and, and all that. So it, they were, and also the rule of law. So they were uh, in a bit of hot water and the... the, the, the the attempt uh, of Belarus to flood the country with, uh, with uh, or at least to send to, send to the country uh, uh, migrants was seen as a boon by the government because it could like uh, uh, turn the turn this into uh, a bit of a national crisis to say oh you know uh, uh, the Belarus is trying to send uh, to send migrants to us uh, to the to the country but we are here to pro to protect you from uh, from Belarus from the migrants from Russia you see the government is acting the opposition is weak blah 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 and that's why also the the uh, we're having a very strong position so that's why also Poland was uh, preventing uh, European help because the Europeans of course offered help to to to, to Poland to deal with the, to deal with the, the, the crisis but Poland refused they they refused to have Frontex or the the European agency in charge of the of uh, of borders to, to to come help, despite the fact that Frontex is based in in Poland, like I like I mentioned, uh, he, uh, they they also ins inst uh, installed a, uh, a no go zone uh, around the the, the uh, around the border at uh, the Belarus border, so that journalists NGOs could not could not get there. So it was a, a bit of a black box for for quite a while. Uh, the, the 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 border between the uh, Poland and and, uh, and Belarus, all that because the government wanted to take uh, benefit nationally uh, from from the crisis. Uh, I don't know to which extent it was it was uh, successful, but they definitely uh, used that a bit uh, cynically. Uh, what else did uh, did we talk about? Oh, of course, we talked about Russia and the, the fact that they have. That Putin is a big nostalgic of the other Soviet Union. I, I, he always said that, uh, according to him, that's the, the biggest tragedy of the of the of the 20th century, the fall of the USSR. And so, ever since he came to power, he's trying to, to rebuild the, the Russian Empire, uh, and so to put uh, Belarus, to put uh, Ukraine under uh, the Russian uh, influence, uh, as opposed to the West, because they. they, they he didn't like at all the fact that uh, the the EU and NATO is expanding to e to the east in uh, in what he sees as the the Russian backyard and uh, the, the pretty much the the, the debate, uh, I mean the debate, some debate. Uh, what's happening in the Ukraine uh, over the past few weeks is another attempt of Putin to call dibs on the country and to, and, uh, and get the uh, get NATO out of what he considers to be uh, to be his backyard. Uh, and I mean, we, we discussed on that several times on, on the news reviews uh, uh, on Sundays, but there is a, a lot of expectation that he doesn't necessarily want to invade Ukraine just to get put pressure on NATO and force them to, to back off from, uh, from what he sees as his uh, uh, own backyard. Uh, he also mentioned something that is very true, especially in the history of the EU, the idea that the, 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 the Ukrainian crisis and Basically, any crisis uh, is cynically a, a boon because it creates uh, an incentive and, a, and a, a need for the EU to, to move forward because otherwise uh, the EU loves to do to to, to do what uh, to, to stay in, to stay neutral. I mean, to, uh, not to stay neutral, but uh, to keep things as they are. The, the member states are not very uh, do not necessarily like change, and it's only when uh, when the needs arise, when the crisis happen that. Then uh, member states are ready to are ready to, to, to do to have the EU do something. I mean, we saw that on the on the, the, the during the COVID crisis, huh, well, with the with the collective buying of the of the vaccines, uh, that was something born out of uh, out of need. Uh, we uh, there is, there is also that in uh, in the context of of Ukraine, where the EU is seeing that well, and uh, it's a bit lacking in terms of defense and uh, defense policy and foreign affairs policy. So there is a a renewed debate about well how the EU should shrink and get stronger when it comes to, to foreign policy to uh, to defense. Uh, we'll see what comes out for instance of the of the conference on the future of Europe and whether member states will be keen on uh, 
doing anything on that front and uh, along what they call the, the strategic compass, which is supposed to to set the roadmap for the renewed uh, EU foreign policy and defense. Uh, he talked also about the li linking uh, foreign policy and trade, which is, he said that was something that the EU could actually be strong about, which is very true. I mean, it's, it goes back to uh, the, the Brussels effects or the, the fact that the EU can have leverage over the rest of the world because of the sheer size of its market. Uh, and that it's a unified, a unified market. So he, he was uh, uh, playing a long uh, debate about around trade policy that is uh, that is quite current. Is uh, how do you should use trade as a as a tool uh, to 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 further its relation? Well, well not further its relation, but uh, influence third country, whether it's on human rights, on, on uh, environment, climate change, uh, or push back against, uh, against aggressive, uh, aggressive countries uh, or uh, uh, not so democratic countries. So that, that, that's a debate that is uh, uh, rising a lot. The French, uh, the French government, uh, as part of the French presidency, is also pushing in that, in that sense with, uh, with what is called the, the um, the mirror clauses. So the mirror clauses is a, a bit of a principle of reciprocity is it in a, in a, in trade deals. Is the idea that you uh, how could I explain that uh, simply? Uh, it's the idea that you uh, you import products that respect uh, the the same. Uh, the, the same standards as, as the EU, and if they don't, then you tax them, so, so to say. And it leads to a number of, of debates about whether it's uh, it's compatible with uh, uh, WTO rules or with international rules around uh, around trade. Uh, whether it's uh, it's transforming uh, uh, the the, the trade the, the economy into a political tool. So there's a lot of debate that are that are occurring around trade policy uh, around that and that play into the idea of the EU as a geopolitical power because trade is the main geopolitical tool and power that, I mean the you would say the only real power that the EU has uh, geopolitically because on the rest of uh, on defense uh, pff, it doesn't exist uh, foreign affairs uh, pff, doesn't exist so it's uh, for now apart from our economic power we don't exactly have uh, something to, to, to call our own um we talked about the balkans so the the, the, the fact that they're still far away from uh, from going into the uh, into the eu because there's uh, a lot of reforms to, to be done because uh, before a country can enter the eu they have to to bring their country up to speed uh on all level uh, economically uh on the on the the the, the con i mean on the the political infrastructure as well the judi judicial system etc et so the idea is not to have a uh, a failed state entering the EU and that uh, that would bring everyone uh, everyone uh, backwards, which uh, takes a lot of time, and that's among the main reasons why the EU, uh, on all level except economical, you are at level to join the EU. Well, technically, you are already part of the EU. You are, uh, I mean, Spain is in the EU. You you are a European citizen, so you don't need, <laughs> you know. I mean, uh, I mean, Spain is to an extent. Uh, uh, with Portugal, uh, one of the uh, of the poster childs of the of how the EU uh, process helped a country like uh, get up to speed uh, economically, because when when Spain joined the the EU, it was pretty uh, quite behind the, the main member state, like behind France, behind Italy, behind. behind uh, uh, behind Germany in terms of economy and uh, the, the prospect of joining the EU accelerated the tra accelerate the transition towards uh, to, to to the democracy and then economically the uh, uh, the, the country to, to catch up with the uh, with the other. But yeah, lots of work to, to be done in the, in the Balkans. Even if there is a uh, where the dictatorship does what what's to M what were you talking about? Uh, I missed something there. I'm missing there. Something there. So so complete, complete the message, Carpus. Oh, okay. 
Ugh, memes. Memes in chat, you know, that it's like... Uh, memes without an image, you know, it's uh, it's not exactly... Uh, uh, I, I, I've always struggled with memes without, without images. But anyway, going back to the Balkans, there's also the, the, the idea of, a, of the double discourse of the EU as well there, because the EU is, uh, has been saying for decades now to back, oh yeah, yeah, you will join eventually, but not yet. Wait a little bit. And uh, there is a more and more frustration in the Balkan states uh, around uh, around that because they feel that they are being being led on by the EU that the EU is not actually willing to 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 fulfill its promises. Will they go the way of Turkey? Ah, that brings up the topic of Turkey. Uh, I would not go. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think the Balkan will go the way of Turkey because contrary to Turkey, uh, there is I think a genuine intention. Uh, and a general agreement within the EU on the fact that uh, that the Balkan states should enter the EU, which is not the case for Turkey. I mean, Turkey, there is, on this, it's undeni completely undeniable. There is an absolute, an absolute double discourse and complete hypocrisy on both sides of the, of the table around, uh, on, uh, around the, the perspective of Turkey joining the EU. I mean, there is no way in hell Turkey will ever join uh, the EU. That was already the case even before uh, the, the backsliding of the of the rule of law and the, and the democracy in uh, in, uh, in Turkey. That was France was never going to agree on the fact that uh, and the, I expect the Netherlands and Denmark as well would never agree to to have Turkey join the EU. And it's a bit of a uh, of a poker game at, at, the, at this stage where both are waiting for the other to 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 give up first because they don't want to 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 have to carry the the, the the political consequences of being the one to pull the plug but there's no way in hell turkey is ever going to join the eu uh for the balkan however that's a different story I, uh, they, they, it's there is consensus around i think uh, uh in, in most member states around the idea that Balkan, the Balkan states near, will belong in the uh, are legitimate to belong to the EU and will join the EU at some point. But the question is when, because there is anxiety around the uh, the idea of enlargement. Uh, quite a few member states are feeling uh, that uh, you did not deal very well with the uh, the, the the last extension to the east. Uh, that we are still dealing with the fact that. Uh, uh, that part of the issue that the EU is having is the fact that it didn't manage to deal completely with the the sudden entrance of 10 member states that may, might not have been completely... I mean, they were ready, but uh, they, they, there is the issue of the rule of law, the backsliding, so the EU has already enough on its plate not to add the Balkan state to, to, to it. Which creates tension because the Balkan state on their end is like, okay, do you want me or do you not want me? Because China and Russia are very interested in having uh, good relationships with the Balkan states. Uh, with no well, no strings attached, strings attached, but not the same kind of of uh, as the EU. Uh, let's see what else did you, uh, so the mixed measure I just covered that uh, the rule of law mechanism. We had a discussion on the fact that, uh, in his opinion, the Commission and that generally the opinion of the of the, the European Parliament that the Commission should have uh, already acted and activated the rule of law mechanism against Hungary and uh, against. Uh, Poland and uh, he was pretty clean that uh, clear on the fact that not activating the, uh, the rule of law mechanism before the Hungarian election in April uh, is in itself uh, an, if, an interference in the in the election because that means that they are giving uh, three points to 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 Orban. But yeah, he, he, uh, he, we will see how uh, things will evolve because the, the ruling of the Court of Justice is coming uh, in a couple of weeks, on the 16th of February. Uh, so that's two months away from the uh, from the Hungarian election. So things could happen in the meantime. Uh, it will depend on the political pressure that uh, uh, that occur against the Commission and uh, the member state around that. Uh, and yeah, the other points are rather minor, so uh, given the time, I will not dive into it. Uh, if you have comments or questions, now is the time. Otherwise, I will start my conclusion. Uh, up, let me just 
close that down. That's good. I don't see any comments, so let me do my conclusion. So uh, I hope that you like enjoy the enjoy the interview as usual. Uh, I will be back uh, on Sunday for the news review at six in French and at eight. Uh, in English, as usual, uh, we are going back to a more normal kind of uh, scheduling. This week was a bit, was a bit light, but uh, next week I have the two interviews. Uh, the week after I have the two interviews, so things will go uh, back to normal, so to say. Um, and yeah, so uh, as always, if you like what you saw, follow the channel. Uh, you can even uh, you follow on Twitch, you can follow on, on YouTube and all that. Actually, I'm going to drop the links in the chat. There you go. If you really like what you what you saw, you can even toss a coin to your streamer on coffee uh, if you're feeling generous. And otherwise, uh, well, I wish you all a good evening, a good weekend, and I will see you on Sunday. Bye, guys.